banana versus peel? That's your question. Okay, another 20 seconds. And uh, hold on, let me mute the classroom. Um, who's next? Please just raise your hand. Who is next? I don't see anyone. Is, is no one next? Like someone, someone's got to be next. If you don't call them small, start at the beginning of the alphabet. Catherine, is that you? I'm not sure if it was me, but I think it was a few people before me. But I'll, I'll um, I'm just. Oh, I don't want to skip those people if they're if they're if they're not. Uh, <laughs> uh, um. All right, Catherine, it's you. I'm sorry. Okay. Hey, Professor. Yeah. I, uh, I didn't go last time. I think you were in the Spies last time. I know I called in a Dallas. Okay, so maybe maybe it's Michael. All right, Michael, I'll start with you. You guys, uh, if you could just, you you know you know the alphabet. Just keep track of where you are because I, I this is it's a waste of time to do this in, the, in class. Um, and I teach back to back. I can't remember where I am in every section. All right, Michael, what would you put here? What's your answer? Uh, I, I just put an acquisition goes to the the finder. Is that the rule? Is that all the case held? Um, I think the, the case talked about multiple cases in the back. Well, that's what I'm trying to get. What is the rule that was actually established by Hannah? The owner of the land possesses everything attached to it with exceptions. What are the exceptions? Um, the exceptions are if if the if it was attached to the land. Um, it, it, I don't remember us talking specifically about this, uh, but it seemed like the, the courts were kind of looking more at the relationships between the two people, uh, between the parties. Um, and hmm. In the case, South. Uh, Staff Staffordshire Water Company, where they um, where they founded it in the pool. Um, it seemed like uh, because the person was an employee, and they found the the ring that they had to give it to the landowner. But in the situation of uh, Hannah versus Peel, where the guy had never lived in the house, he had no knowledge of uh, of the um, the pen. The well, not quite. I mean, you're in the, in the ballpark. Uh, Emma, are you here? What would what, what'd you say is the rule in Hannah versus Peel? Um, like the owner of a property doesn't have the right to a lost item on their property. What's a lost item mean? It's someone else's item that they may have dropped on their property. Like they had possession over it. They may have I mean, you, it's probably most likely that they dropped it somewhere and then they can't find it. And so unless did, they... Did Hannah versus Peel consider the difference between whether it was dropped accidentally? Was that part of Hannah? No. So then what's the rule in Hannah v. Peel? Well, I mean, I would still say that the rule is that the owner of a property doesn't have the right to something on their property that isn't theirs. That's not it at all. Uh, 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 Lacey, help us out here. What's the rule in Hannah? I'm questioning what I wrote, but I put um, a man possesses everything that is attached to his land, but does not necessarily possess everything that's unattached to the that's land. That's it. That's the rule. He said it in the opinion. The reason why I'm giving you a hard time, and Lacey, you're exactly right, is, is because these cases have complicated rules, and they're not like torts where there's a single four-factor test, right? The, the, the Hannah case laid down a couple different tests which you need to know. And I think you summarize it quite well. Just read it one more time, Lacey. Um, a man possesses everything that is attached to his land, but a man does not necessarily possess everything unattached to his land. Perfect. The line that the Hannah court drew was between property that's attached and not attached. 
right? If something is attached, which I think means buried, it doesn't say that exactly. If something's buried in the property, then it will almost certainly belong to the property owner. But if something's laying unattached, it will probably go to the finder, right? I, I put this summary um, in your class notes on um, Monday. I'll, I'll put it again at the top of today's class. Um, you should have just said this, right? I mean, I, I gave you the summary, which is why I'm so much frustrated people didn't get it. Uh, if I give you a summary, you should use it. Um, it's there. Um, I gave it to it again, right? But the line is whether it's attached to the ground or not. All right. Everyone get that rule. The fact that they were the agent was mentioned. That wasn't that wasn't the reason why the court ruled at all. Um, whether the item was lost or misplaced was actually the next case, McAvoy. It was not in Hannah. That that was not a distinction the the Hannah court relied upon. All right, let's try question number two. Question number two. Again, short answer. Why did the shopkeeper prevail on McAvoy versus Medina? This is me for Sandra in about 30 seconds. Okay. All right, Sandra, help us out here. Why did the shop owner win in McAvoy? Um, it said that he had a superior claim to the um, um, the person that gave him the... That's contract. true. He had a superior claim. Why did he have a superior claim? Um, I believe it was because um, the person accidentally dropped it. It wasn't like um, they intentionally... Oh, no, I'm sorry. It was that they intentionally put it there. They put put what where? Let's just maybe re like the. It was like a checkbook thing. A pocketbook. It was a pocketbook. Yeah, pocketbook. And where and was it? it? On the okay, it was on a table, right? Yeah. Sandra, what does it mean when someone puts a pocketbook or a wallet on the table? Um, they might come back from it. Ah, so why would you let the property owner keep it in that case? Um, he has a duty to kind of keep it safe. Good. What do you call that duty? What's the word we used? We gave a term for it. Um, I can't remember. Okay. Uh, who's next? Uh, Victor, are you there? Uh, I think you're in the classroom. Yes. Um, thank you. Victor, what, what do you call that duty? This is not good. Not good, guys. This is stuff from two days ago. Victor, check your notes. Look at your notes from the last class. Sure. Yeah, okay, take your time. We'll, we're, we're waiting. Hey, guys, put your hands down. You'll get it. Thank you. What is the duty called when someone gives property to hold? My other section got this in two seconds. Bailey? I'm sorry? Bailey? Well, who's the yeah. Bailey? What, what's the duty called? Bailey is close, but that's not the answer. Bailment. Okay. Yeah. Bailment. 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 What's a bailment there, Victor? It's an act of delivering goods to a bailey for a specific purpose. Okay. That's correct. Like giving like ownership. Oh, you ran yourself into a trouble. Is it giving ownership? Is that what a bailment is? A transfer. 
is it is it is it permanent? No. So why is it giving ownership? I said it was without. I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. I apologize. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, look, guys, um, uh, you need to do better. Uh, this is just reviewing, and and you're missing. And it's 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 not fair, but I'm going to compare. The other section was much more in their A game. Um, so, you know, I can do back to back. So, um, you need to come to class familiar with what we covered last class. If if not, you're going to fall behind very quickly. All right, Grayson, go ahead. Just in our other classes, I just pointed over this class. Um, we were told like to kind of throw out the facts and kind of focus on the rules. I don't. I I, that, that, I never said you should do that. No, no, not you. That's why yeah. I'm at. And in, in our other class, that's just I, I don't remember. Like, uh, okay, well, I mean that's not an excuse because I asked what a bailment was. That's something with facts. Right. That's okay. I was just yeah. No excuses. Yeah, I mean I, I'm not not picking on you, but but if I give a criticism, the answer is not because we do in other classes. That that's that's not an answer. Um, you guys are one L's. You're now in your second semester. You're gonna have four new professors every semester in these four sets of rules. Um, I expect you to remember what we did last class, and the class before that, and the class before that. Um, if I sense you're not, I'll become more strict and 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 ask harder questions. If I sense it's not keeping up, all right, all right, all right. Let's move on to our today. See, we're already ten minutes in. We haven't even done the new stuff yet. Question number three, and this is gonna be for uh, Garrett. What are the three elements of giving a gift? The three elements of giving a gift. This is going to be for uh, Garrett in about 30 seconds. Another five seconds and Garrett's on call. All right, Garrett. Three elements, go. Oh, you're in the classroom. I'm sorry. I apologize. Go ahead. I must intend to transfer the property. Okay, the number one is intent. Okay, what's number two? Uh, the donor must uh, deliver possession. Okay, number two, the donor must deliver possession. Okay, what's number three? And then the donee must accept. Okay, very good. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, exactly right. There are three elements of a gift, and I think you probably know this already. First, there has to be intent. And let me just be more precise. There has to be a present intent. That is, I'm giving you the gift today. It's not, I'm giving you the gift tomorrow. I'm giving you the gift next month. I'm giving you the gift after I die. It's, I'm giving you the gift now. So number one, I intend to give you the gift now. Number two, I am in fact delivering the gift to you now, right? It's not enough just to have it in your head. You got to actually do something. You have to deliver the gift now. The third one is almost automatic. It's presumed that if a gift is delivered, it's accepted. Not always, right? You can decline a gift. You're allowed to. But generally with free stuff, people don't turn it down, right? If someone wants to give you a valuable gift, you're not going to say no. Maybe you will. Maybe you don't want it, right? Imagine someone wants to give you a piece of property that you have no you have no interest in maintaining, right? They want to give you an old broken down house you have to go fix up. Maybe you don't want it, right? So there are going to be cases where you decline acceptance. But generally, if there's a successful delivery, there is a successful acceptance. It's going to be rare when you have one and not the other. I, I'm sure there are cases, but we, we courts, presume it. Ray, go ahead. Yeah, what's uh, like an accepted way to like not accept the delivery? So like what would be commonly used to, to do that? Say no, I don't want it. Okay. If you if you were if you have a writing saying I reject this gift, if right. you know if someone tries to hand something, he's like, no, 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 I don't want it, I don't want it, right? Or or you know, someone hands you the key, give it right back to them. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's gonna be rare, but but you can decline a gift. I mean, again, the, the, the good example is imagine someone wants to give you a piece of property, it's it's old, it's broken down, right? It needs repairs. You don't pay property tax on it. You just don't, you don't want to deal with it. So he's like, screw it, I don't want it. There used to be a case in the book where there was, um, they took it out, but it used to be in your case book where you had a piece of property built on soil 
that was very soft and you couldn't build any sort of any sewage on it. So basically you had a piece of property that you couldn't build a house on and the person could not get rid of it. No one wanted to take it as a gift. No one wanted to buy it and he was stuck with it. So he told the government, I don't want it. It's not mine anymore. The government's like, nope, you have to pay your property taxes on it. So it was like this thing where he was stuck with this land that was absolutely useless. You couldn't build anything because there was no, you couldn't build septic, you couldn't build sewage, nothing. You got maybe an outhouse, I suppose, right? You go camping on it, but you couldn't build on it. So the, the, the rule is you generally, you're stuck with it. Well, you can't even give it away. All right, but very good. Thank, thank you for that, Ray, for that question. All right. So again, the three elements, you have in a present intent to give, you have delivery, and you got, um, you have to accept the gift. But I'm not even going to mention acceptance because it's almost always going to be satisfied. All right. Take a look at question number four, please. So it's multiple choice. Um, here's the question. O owns a ring. And by the way, in this class, when the person's name is O, that just means you're the owner, the original owner, like O. It sounds obvious, but just to make it clear. O owns a ring. While visiting her daughter, A, O leaves the ring on the, on, on the bathroom sink of the daughter's house. After O leaves, A discovers the ring. Uh-oh. A calls O to tell her the discovery. And O says, keep it as a gift. So here's my question. Has O made a valid gift to her daughter? Has the mom made a valid gift to her daughter? Yes or no? And I think this will be for David in about 10 seconds. Hmm. This one's close. Oh, boy. Close, close, close. I think I got just about everyone. All right, David. Go ahead. What would you put here? I put uh, no because there wasn't a present intent to give the ring while she was at the house. It was more of like an afterthought. Well, let me well, let me just ask you a question. When she actually said to her on the phone, you can keep it, right? You can keep the ring. Was that saying you can keep it in the future or you can keep it now? It's ambiguous. I don't think it, it is. I don't think it's ambiguous at all. But I just want to take the ring later. It's just a temporary hold. Is that what she said? I don't see that. Where's it temporary? You should keep it as a gift, as you said. Uh, I put no because I didn't think that there is a present intent. That's not my question. My, my question is different. When she said, I'm, I'm reading the question right here. It says, O yeah. tells A to keep the ring as a gift. Is that a present intent or a future intent? Just that one that one element. A present, I guess. A present. Hmm. Catherine, what'd you put? Uh, I put um, that, yes, it was a gift that they did have intent because she said on the phone, um, keep it as a gift that shows her intent. Delivery was the one that was a little more questionable, but I thought of it as um, it was in her daughter's possession, but it wasn't delivered until she said, why don't you keep it? And since it was already in her possession, it was considered delivered at that time. Catherine, do you need to do these elements in order to have a valid um, gift? You know, what, what did he say a minute ago, right? Intent, delivery, acceptance. Do you do in that order? I think that it doesn't have to be delivery could go before intent. Yeah, let me ask you one more question. You, you're, you're almost done, Catherine. You're almost, you're almost out, out, of the, out of the woods. What would happen if the if the mom said you can keep as a gift? And the daughter says, "Wait a minute, I paid attention in property class. We're doing this out of order. Mom, I want you to come here. I'm going to give you the ring. Then you give it back to me, and I accept. And then we have a gift. Would that work? Uh, it would work because she's still delivering the gift. But I think it would have worked in the first place. Yes. Do the courts require you the stupid thing where you have to give it and give it back? No. Okay, that's right. The answer here is, is there is a valid gift. Okay, there is a valid gift, and this one was close, um, guys. This was was a fifty six forty four. That's pretty close. So I mean that 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 that's not a uh, that's a pretty close margin. Um, the important factor is this: you don't have to do the gifts, the steps in order. 
And the reason why is for the example I gave Catherine. The courts are not going to make you do a stupid thing where the mom comes over, you hand the ring to the mom, the mom hands the ring back to the daughter to make it all, all in order. So long as the elements are present, there's a valid gift. And this gift could not be revoked. The mom made the gift, can't be revoked. She, uh, Grayson, go ahead. Um, so in terms of delivery, I thought the point of delivery was to like show that they went out of their way to give this delivery. Here it seems that she kind of left it behind. It was like, okay, you can keep it. That doesn't really seem like she went through the labor of steps to say, hey, I'm delivering this to you. It's actual delivery. She actually brought it to her house. The ring was no longer in the mom's possession. It was in the daughter's home. That's actually very good evidence that, that there's delivery. Right? Think of the piano in the Newman case. The piano remained in the master's room. It didn't go to the, to the housekeeper's room. Right? The concept of delivery we'll talk about is very flexible. What exactly is delivery? It's not set in stone. Um, so here, this was sufficient to, uh, to be a delivery. Uh, Lacey, was your hand up as well? I saw it up a moment ago. Yeah, but you answered it because I was I was thinking about the case <clears throat> with um, Van Pelt and Julia and how the insurance policy was not actually delivered into her hand, even though she had the keys and she could have had. Right. So I was thinking. But here, the but insurance. here the daughter had the actual ring. It wasn't like you know maybe a ring box. It was the actual ring itself, and that is good enough for delivery. Okay. Yeah, Andy, go ahead. So. Uh, can you hear me? Right, loud and clear. Okay. Um, so intent at the time of delivery doesn't necessarily... No, it it's when you give the intent, it must be a present intent, even if that present intent comes after the delivery in this case. It's a, it's a weird hypo, and I, I get it. It's actually on page 115 from your book. I didn't make this up. So if, if people are nodding, I didn't, yeah, not that original, right? If you go to 115, it's right there, so you can check to see how the book explains it. Yeah, yeah Alexander, go ahead. So, I, Lacey brought up a good point about, you know, the difference between the case that we had to read for today and, you know, this hypo, hypo. So, would this be considered constructive or is it just like plain? This is actual, my friend. Okay. She actually, this is not, I'm giving you a letter or I'm giving you a key to my jewelry box. I'm giving you the ring itself. This is actual, which is why when you have actual delivery, the rules are much more permissive of what a delivery is. Right, because the issue was that symbolic. Right, yeah, we'll get to symbolic in a few minutes, I promise. Okay. You're going to hate me, but we'll get to it. <laughs> okay, thank that, you. The, 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 that case is awful. I mean, it's one of the hardest cases in the book. By the way, the other case, Gruen's even harder. These are two of the hardest cases in the book. Maybe why I'm so strict today, because it's, it's not, today's going to be a tight class. We're going to be very short on time, I promise. All right, everyone, everyone get with question four. Right, let's do question number five, please. This one's a little bit longer. Um, multiple choice also. Suppose that A does not call her mom to tell her the ring has been found. A week later, it's in with friends. The daughter surprises the mom by wearing the ring. The mom takes the ring, looks at it, and gives it back to A, saying, I want you to have it. It's yours. Okay, so now there's no doubt there's a gift, right? There's present intent, and there's delivery. But A tries a ring on, and it's too large for A. O then says, here, daughter, let me wear it until you can get it fixed and cut down to your size. Tragically, O wears the ring and gets hit by a car and dies. In this class, people always die. It's always very sudden. It's always very sad. Then A sues the executor of O's estate, so my question is this. The mom gave a gift to the daughter. Can that gift be revoked by the mom? That's my question to you. Uh, Taylor, are you here? In about five seconds. I think you're in the classroom, if I remember correctly. My notes are right. Okay, Taylor, are you there? Yes. What's your answer here? I said no. O couldn't revoke the gift. Okay, why? Well, there was a gift made, and then the owner says, I'll hold on to it, basically, until you need it. Yeah. 
And I was thinking of the Broom case where there was the life estate and the cliff painting. Very and, good, uh, very good. Yeah. So um, the mom took the ring back from the daughter. Did the daughter object? Okay. The mom took the ring back from the daughter. Did the daughter object? So what exactly did the daughter give to the mom at that point? What would we call that interest? A life estate. Well, she, she ended up dying a few minutes later, so I guess that might be technically true. Um, but generally, what do you call it when you give someone to hold on to for some period of time, but not it's not a permanent gift? What do you call oh, that? Like per permission? Oh, they all met. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I had. Uh, was Victor's question a couple minutes ago, right? So the daughter gave the mom a bailment, right? There was not a gift. There was not a revocation of the gift. The mom merely let the mom, uh, sorry, the daughter let the mom hold it for some duty of care for some period of time. The fact that she got hit by a car was you know, unexpected. But again, in this class, people always die suddenly. That's just, that's how this class works. All right, thank you for that, Taylor. All right, everyone, do you get questions one through five? Uh, uh, Garrett, go ahead. I think you're in the classroom, so I'll mute it. Good. So it's a good way to think about that situation as in like the mom was basically basically giving her the gift of title and- No, don't, don't use the word title. The word title is so messy. Uh, trust me on this right. one. Um, no, the mom gave the daughter the ring. She gave right. her the ring, it's hers, right? But then the daughter gave the mom just a bailment to the ring. I think that's the way I would right. describe it. Yeah. I know law students love using the word title, but it's such a messy word. I just, I wouldn't use it for, for a lot of reasons that I can maybe explain later in the semester. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, but good question. Thank you for that. Hmm. Okay. Questions on these five multiple, uh, the five poll questions. If you don't get these, go back and reread them after class because um, we were a little bit choppy to start of class. We're picking up some speed, but uh, you know, you got you to gotta be ready. It, it really is unfair. I'm sorry that I have the first class compared to. I have no way around it. Uh, but but I know that I can see percentages, and they're getting higher percentage questions right. So just you know, it's you know, you, you're, of course you're curved separately. I'm not going to curve you together, but you have to know where you are in relation to your people in your other sections. All right. So you're in this together. Thirty five of you. How many there are? Thirty two. Um. All right, let's go on to the next case. Um, the next case is admittedly hard. Um, it was written in a very uh, confusing fashion, and I spend hours every semester trying to make sense of this case and trying to get it right in my head because it, it's not easy. So I want to walk you through this perhaps out of order because the way the court lays out the facts is completely nonsensical. Your outline is going to be a mess. After class, go over the case summary I put online. It will help clean it up, I think. Um, Sarah, uh, Sarah L, I think you're in the classroom. Yes. No, I'm not. Sorry, I'm no, online today. You're online today. Okay, that, that's fine. Just if you're not, just just correct me. All right. So, so before we get started with the actual intricacies, can you just describe the relationship between uh, Mr. Van Pelt and Julia Newman? Um, yes, I think it's kind of a gross relationship, actually. A kind of. Was it a, you said a gross relationship. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Tell me why. Well, he's obviously a very old man, and <laughs> she's a very young girl. Uh huh. How did they come together to be in a relationship? Just this actually is relevant to the case. I know it's gross, but just um, she worked as his housekeeper, and oh. she's been his housekeeper for ten years. And where does she live? In his house. Yeah. And uh, what kind of? I mean, I don't need details, but how did? How do you think Mr. Van Pelt viewed uh, Miss Julie? Um, that's well, probably a little bit more than just a housekeeper. Yeah. Did he ever try to make the relationship formal? That's what I'm getting at. Um, it said that he made a, he didn't ever propose, but he kind of like made an intent that he was going to marry her. Ah, so he promised her but never actually followed through. Yes. Did he promise her some other stuff? Yes. He promised her, well, before he before he became sick, did he promise her something he never actually followed through on? For example, he promised her a piano. Yeah, furniture in her bedroom. Did he ever actually give her the piano? No. Okay. And then the piano got destroyed. Yeah, and, and did he ever buy her a new piano after it got destroyed? No. 
But he kept and telling her it's her piano, right? Yeah, called it Julia's piano or something. Yeah, okay, excellent. Thank you so much for that, Sarah. All right, so I mean, uh, she described it as gross. I'll just let her comment stand. I don't need to give any more commentary, but he was probably stringing her along. Sarah, that's not about right. Yeah, she's nodding if you can't hear. Yeah. You know, you can imagine he was married to his wife for several decades. Uh, his wife died. He was in his 50s. Uh, this 18 year old orphan moves in with him. Um, it's like every soap opera, they develop a relationship. Um, and he makes her all these promises. Oh, I'm going to marry you. Oh, I'm going to buy you a piano. And he never actually does, never follows through. And then you can imagine when he dies, this uh, housekeeper shows up and the people are like, who the hell are you? What are you doing here? You're just a housekeeper, right? You know, Cinderella, get lost. Um, and she's like, oh, wait till you hear what I know. All right. So there are four specific gifts at issue in this case. Sarah just mentioned one of them, which was the piano. And she already gave it a fact, so I'll just, I'll just repeat what she said. Um, there was a piano that was in the living room or the parlor. They called it Miss Julie's Piano. Right, and he kept saying, uh, "This is your piano." Um, there was a fire; the piano burned, and they got a three hundred dollar insurance payout on the piano. Um, did he ever give her the piano? No. Did he ever buy her a new piano? No. Did he give her the three hundred dollars from the policy? No. He didn't give her anything. All right. So what happens, Miss Julia? claims the piano all right now i want to give you some terminology before we get started okay and this terminology is very important uh that was sarah uh miranda are you here i'm here thank you miranda miranda what is the difference between a donor and a donee donor versus donee not a donut a donor versus a donee um, a donor is the person giving, and then the donee is the person accepting. Okay, that's good. How do you how do you remember the difference? At least maybe one way to remember the difference. Uh, the last two letters of like donor is like they're giving, and then like donee is like the two e's. Me, remember? right? Me, me, me. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Thank you, thank you, Miranda. So the donor is a person giving a gift, and specifically, it's a gift. And I want you just to remember that. Uh, you have a grantor grantee when you're selling stuff, but for a gift, it's donor or donee. Just, just, just keep that in your head. Um, think of like a donation almost, like you're giving as a gift. Uh, in this case, Van Pelt was the old guy, the gross guy, to use Sarah's phrase, was the donor. He was the giver. And then Miss Julia was a donee. She received gifts. Okay. Or at least she, she said she received. It's unclear if she, she actually did receive them. Okay, the next phrase I want to give you guys is an intervivos gift. An intervivos gift. Uh, Alexandra, what's an intervivos gift? Um, from what I understand, it's just a gift between living people. Right. It's a gift given during life. Can an intervivos gift be revoked? No. Okay. Why? Um, because after the three elements are satisfied, the person giving no longer has ownership of it. Okay, good. Alexandra, let me ask you a follow-up. What is a gift causa mortis, also called a donatio? And, and these are, I'm typing this in the class notes if you aren't looking, but a gift or donatio causa mortis. What does that phrase mean, Alexandra? Uh, that's when a person gives a gift because they're about to die. Uh-huh. Can a gift causa mortis be revoked? Um... No, because they're going to die. Well, if they don't die, then. Exactly. So what if, you know, what if you're on your deathbed, you know, like, oh, crap, I'm about to die. I don't have time to call a lawyer. I don't have time to go to the bank. And you just say to your housekeeper, I give you everything. And then you make a miraculous recovery and you're just fine. He's like, just kidding. Just JK. Right. Just kidding. Never mind. Can you do that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you can. Thank you. Very good, Alexandra. The gift or the donatio causa mortis is still an intervivos gift. It can be revoked. Now, if you die, obviously you can't revoke it. But if, if it's and you're still alive, you're like, never mind, just kidding. Uh, I had a miraculous recovery. I feel great. Bye-bye, uh, housekeeper. You know. Um, the courts are skeptical of these sort of deathbed confessions. Why? 
generally when someone's about to die, they're not in the best state of mind, right? And that's just that's just human, right? You're about to die. You're, you're not thinking straight. Maybe you can't communicate well. Maybe your voice is going. Maybe you know you don't. You, you're not really aware of what's going on, right? So the gift causa mortis is given in anticipation of death, but maybe don't die. One more phrase, which comes up in the next case. Uh, this is for uh, Rachel M. Are you here, Rachel? I think you're in the classroom. I'm here. Online. Oh, you're online today. Okay, I guess you guys moved back and forth. Um, Rachel, what is a testamentary gift? This comes up in the second case. Oh, yeah, I got to the second case. Um, it is a gift that's in a will. Good. Is is a testamentary gift inter vivos? Um, is it given no, during life? No, it's in the event of a death. Right. So if I give you a testamentary gift, is there anything transferred in the present? No. What's When does it actually transfer, uh, Rachel? Um, after the person has died. Good. Can a testamentary gift be revoked? Um, I guess it could be if you change the well. No, because the person's died. No, no. no. Well, obviously, while a person's still alive, can a testamentary gift be revoked? Yes. Of course. Can you rip up a will? Absolutely. You can rip it up and make a new one, right? Um, you can rip up a will and make a new one. Um, Rachel, just one, one more question. Um, with a testamentary gift, is there any present intent to give anything in the present? Um, yeah, the intent is there. But it, is it intent to give something in the present? No. No, that's right. Okay, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, maybe some of you have wills. Maybe your parents or grandparents have wills. Um, a will is just a document, right? Um, it doesn't have to be formal, right? In Texas... You can have what's called a holographic will, which sounds much cooler than it is. A holographic just means it's in your own handwriting. You can take a cocktail napkin, scribble something on that cocktail napkin, and Texas, that's a valid will, right? I would not recommend it because you're probably gonna screw, you're gonna screw things up if you do that, but you could do that. But generally, when you actually wanna have a lawyer or someone prepare a will for you, you have to comply with something called the statute of wills. You remember from contracts, the statute of frauds, right? The statute of fraud says a contract must be in writing. It has to be signed, right? Does it sounds familiar? Um, the reason why you have the statute of frauds is, as the name suggests, to prevent fraud. If you have an oral contract and it's he said, she said, you don't really know what the terms are, right? You don't know what the terms are at all, okay? But when it's in writing, you can at least argue about what the terms are. The statute of wills is similar to the statute of frauds. It's designed to prevent fraud because when a person's dead, they can't tell you what they intended, right? An oral will is a very bad idea because a person's dead. It's, he said, she said, you know, how do we know that Ms. Julia is telling the truth that Mr. Um, Van Pelt actually said the things he said in the, on his death? We don't know. There's no recording. There's no iPhone. We, we can't be sure. If you ever see the movie, um, <laughs> Avengers Endgame, uh, Iron Man, played by Tony Stark, actually recorded a holographic will. It's basically a hologram of himself, right? It's an actual holographic will, right? They didn't have that back in the back in the 1800s. Okay, so the statute of wills says wills have to be in writing. And two independent mutual witnesses to sign. Why two witnesses? You want to make sure that the document was not signed under duress, that everyone was there, they were in good conscience, and they signed it willingly and voluntarily. Right. So when you have a testamentary gift, there's no present intent to give a gift. It's a gift after death, right? It's a gift after you die, and you can revoke a, a, a will at any time. All right. Question so far on the statute of wills. All right. Now, Mr. Van Pelt did not have a will. That is, he died in testate. It's a word you'll just need to know. In testate, I N. T-E-S-T-A-T-E, -E, intestate. Intestate just means you die without a will. He could have had a will, but he didn't. 
And because he failed to have a will, he created a lot of difficulties for his family, right? Because you have this dispute between Miss Julia, who is his girlfriend slash almost fiance slash housekeeper, and Bost, who was the executor or the administrator of the will. What happened was after uh, Mr. Um, Van Pelt died, they actually sold all the furniture. And then Ms. Julia shows up and says, hey, I want money. And they're like, who the hell are you? Go away. Right? You know, you're the housekeeper. What, do you, what, what, do you, what are you bothering us for? Okay. Question so far. All right. I want to take the gifts out of order. Um, I think um, uh, I think Sarah mentioned the piano a minute ago. I want to talk about the piano for a bit. Uh, Jeanette, are you here? Yes. <laughs> okay, Jeanette, help us out here with the piano. Did Mr. Van Pelt express an intent to give the piano to Julia? Uh, well, before he died, like Sarah said, he told her that, you know, well, he named it. And under her name is Julia's piano. Well, I don't know if he ever formally titled it. He just he called it Julia's piano. But that's what he yeah, called yeah. it. Okay. Well, yeah, no, there was nothing formally done. He just kind of said, like, it'll be yours. Yeah. We'll put it in the room, but nothing ever happened. So the first element, was there some sort of intent to give her the piano? I don't think so. The book says yeah. The case says yes. But I, I actually kind of agree with you. It's not clear that he did. But does it matter if he had the intent? Does that first factor actually matter? Well, you have to have the other delivery. Was there delivery, uh, Jeanette? No. Well, the piano burned first of all. He took out the. Well, okay. So, but... so before the piano burned, did he ever actually give it to her while still while oh, still existed? No. Where did he keep no. it? He kept it in some other room in the house. Yeah, his parlor, his living room. Yeah. <laughs> and after the piano burned, did he ever give her the three hundred dollars for the insurance policy? He didn't give her no. So, was there any delivery of the piano to Miss Julia? Nope. Nope, there was not. So did she get the piano money? I don't think she got the piano she money. She did not get the piano money. That's right. Okay, thanks, Jeanette. So the first gift, she gets a Zippo. You know, Miss Julia's piano, she gets nothing from the piano. All right. Any questions on the piano? Okay. Uh, yeah, Sebastian, you there? Okay, you're in the classroom, right? Can you hear me, Sebastian? I'm in the classroom. Okay, thanks, Sebastian. I hear you loud and clear. So next, I want to talk about furniture, but not the furniture in Van Pelt's bedroom. Um, I want to talk about the furniture in Mr. I'm sorry, in Miss Julia's bedroom. Um, tell me about the furniture in Miss Julia's bedroom. Was that a gift to her? The court said it was because it proves that he delivered it into her bedroom. Ah. So he did he intent to give her, and I and I'm, I know I'm being sort of repetitive. But I want you to do the elements because it, it helps you a lot in this case. Did he intend to give the furniture that was in her bedroom? Yes. Okay, very good. Did he actually deliver the furniture to her bedroom? Yes. Good. So is there a gift of the of, her, of Julia's bedroom furniture? Yes. Okay, that's right. The court finds, thank you, Sebastian. The court finds that there's evidence that he intended to give it. For example, he said the furniture was hers and he bought it for her. And he, in fact, put the furniture in her room. Now, I don't know if he actually did it himself. He was an old man, kind of gross, apparently. He probably hired someone. <laughs> but in fact, the furniture was put in her room. Okay? Therefore, she got the $45 for the furniture. Any questions in the piano or the Julia's furniture in her bedroom? We'll get to the other stuff in a minute. You see, you see I'm going in reverse order. This case was so poorly written. I just, I, I, I hate it. The, the judge has really made lawsuits miserable. So I think this order makes things cleaner. Lacey, go ahead. So I know when they talk about delivery, they said that if it can be delivered, it should be, but it doesn't. If it can't be, then you can do the symbolic or the whatever. But with the piano, she lived in the house. So what sense would it make to take it from the parlor and stick it in a bedroom? It may not even have fit in her bedroom. So why did they not consider the piano delivered if she lived in the house? Well, um, so I think there's two things with the piano. First, you would need to give some symbol that was hers. So maybe a writing 
right? Maybe something to convey, but merely living it, leaving it where it always was is not evidence of delivery. You don't have to move it, but you have to do something to sig signify that you're transferring it. Second, the fact that the piano burned down, he never bought her a new one, and he never gave her the money is pretty good evidence he didn't think it was hers. So I think it's a, it's the after fire evidence that makes it a little bit cleaner. If it okay. if it never burned down, it was still Miss Julia's piano. Maybe the case comes out differently. So okay. Very good question. Actually, it's a perfect segue, Lacey. My next question is about different types of delivery. So there are th three types of delivery that are discussed in this case. So first off, uh, Sydney, you here? Yes, I'm online. Okay, thank you. Sydney, what is actual, sometimes called manual delivery? Uh, that's when it's going to be hard to use without using the word oh you know you know my follow-up oh you know me so well that oh, that makes me happy uh, uh go ahead do, do your best the transfer of possession uh -huh. like if it was a necklace i put it in your hands good good you put it in my hand i give you a necklace or a ring or whatever is that actual delivery yes let me ask you a follow-up question what's constructive delivery um, handing over an object that will open up access to the subject matter of the gift. Okay, good. Give me an example of a constructive delivery. Uh, like a key to a box, maybe. Okay, very good. Thank you so much, Sydney. All right. So it's very important that you all distinguish active versus constructive delivery. This phrase constructive, you, you hear all the time. Remember we did quasi-property? Quasi and constructive are basically the same thing. It's like almost. It's like not quite delivery, but something close to it. So if I give you the key to a lockbox, right? If I give you the key to a lockbox, right? Um, I'm not giving you the lockbox itself, but the key is a, a, a constructive delivery. The presumption is you want me to have the contents, and there's good reasons why you would use constructive delivery. One, some objects are too big. You can't, you can't move it. Like imagine a huge safe at the vault, right? You can't literally, you can't move it and hand it to someone else. It's too heavy. Also, it's not yours to hand over. The, the 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 bank owns the safe. It's built into a wall somewhere, and you can't move it. Um, so sometimes you need constructive delivery, but the courts are very skeptical of constructive delivery because there's a potential for fraud. There's no guarantee that you are giving what you say you're giving. So the courts are very, very skeptical, which is why Ms. Julia ended up with not very much in this case. Okay. So Sydney told us what constructive delivery is. There's also something called symbolic delivery. And I'm going to tell you, uh, my friends, the difference between constructive and symbolic del delivery is very slight. In fact, I don't want you to get bogged down in deciding which is which. Because very often, the same thing, the same item can be both constructive or symbolic. So let me give you an example. A, a symbolic delivery might be a writing. You say, I am giving Sydney this lockbox. Okay, that's a symbolic delivery. But you could also give a key, saying this key is a symbol of the lockbox. The same item, the key, can both be constructive and the key can also be symbolic. And there's not a good reason why it's one or the other. So don't kill yourself trying to contrast symbolic and, and actual. Um, instead, I would just recognize the difference between constructive and actual. That's really where the money is. That's where you need to know. All right, questions so far. All right, so let's go now to the famous deathbed confession with Mr. Van Pelt. Um, he was in his 60s. Uh, he was quite old. He had suffered paralysis. Um, he couldn't move. He was stuck to his bed. Um, he called his nurse, uh, Miss Houston, and then he called Newman. Van Pelt gave Newman keys. And those keys open up certain pieces of furniture in his home. For example, his bureau, which is basically a, dr a dresser drawer. Um, one of the drawers was locked. And inside the drawer was a life insurance policy payable for $3,000. So 
So apparently Van Pelt said, everything is yours. Right? He pointed everything. Everything's yours. And then he died. He never talked again. He had no written will. Uh, yeah, who's next? Um, uh, Luis, you there? Yes, I'm here. Luis, you know, you, you seem like a nice guy. You seem very trust, trustworthy, very honest. Do you believe Miss Julia's account of what happened here? Are you just maybe a little skeptical? Do I think what? Do you believe Miss Julia's account of what happened here? Oh. You a little skeptical, maybe? A little bit. I mean, she's going to be inheriting a lot of stuff potentially, and she's a younger woman. And three thousand dollars is a lot of money back then. It's a lot. It's a big yeah. amount. Do you think the court was skeptical of Miss uh, Julia's claims here, there, Luis? Yes, and they kind of like go through it in their analysis and kind of, you know, say that same thing. They're kind of unsure of this transaction or, you know, caught or the, uh, what is it? Give cautious mortis. Yeah. If, let, one more question, Luis. If Mr. Van Pelt wanted to give this, this, uh, his housekeeper, girlfriend, his life insurance policy, what would he have just done? Um, he could have given it to her by constructive delivery saying here is the because it was locked in the uh how much how much work would it have taken for him to give her the actual policy not much i mean just get the paper out of the cupboard or whatever it was called and then hand it to her in person because you have yeah. actual delivery you have acceptance of court because she's not going to deny it yeah and have the intent to give it to her so so what do you think mr van pelt actually intended to do by giving her the keys Luis? Was it to give her the piece? Was it to give her the insurance policy inside the drawer? I think it was probably to give her the like the actual furniture piece. Yeah, not what she wanted. <laughs> not what she wanted. Okay, thanks, Luis. Appreciate that. Very good. So, look, he, here's the deal: the court doesn't believe Miss Julia. Poor Miss Julia, right? They don't believe her, and they say, "Okay, he gave her the keys. All we're going to say is he intended to give her the furniture that the keys opened up, right?" He tended to give her the bureau, which is like a dresser drawer. And the court even said, uh, Sarah, I think it's gross, but the, the court said the bureau was meant for women's fashion. So, of course, that's what he wanted to give her, not the life insurance policy. Um, I, would, I would say something different. Because physical delivery of the policy was so simple, it would have taken a minute. He says, hey, open up that drawer and get me that policy. Thank you. Here, take this paper. Done. Right? That would be an actual delivery. Maybe there, but he didn't do that. I mean, my guess again is that Mr. Van Pelt was stringing this poor girl along, leading her on for a decade, thinking her she'd get these riches. And then when he dies, he gives her nothing. Doesn't give her the damn piano, doesn't give her the insurance policy, gives her nothing. That's my read of what happened here. So, what does the court say? Because you could have physically delivered the policy but didn't, you don't get the policy. All you get is the furniture that those keys opened. Other furniture that were not locked up, you don't get. I mean, how much furniture has a key on it? I don't, I don't even own any furniture with keys, but I guess it was big back then. So in the end, all Miss Sarah, I'm sorry, all Miss Julia, sorry, Sarah, all Miss Julia got was the furniture in her bedroom, which was 45 bucks, and the value of the furniture that was um, uh, openable, is that a word? That could be opened by the key. That's all she got. She didn't get the life insurance. She didn't get the piano money. She didn't get the rest of the furniture. Here they said there was not enough for constructive delivery. We construe constructive delivery very narrowly because they're worried that this housekeeper was trying to cheat this wealthy old guy. Most probably he was cheating her. I don't think it was the other way around. I, I think if there was any sort of exploitation, I think it was going from Van Pelt to Julia. Probably not the other way around, but you know, we, we don't know. Yeah, Lisa, go ahead. I think you're on mute. Sorry. I was just thinking when I was reading this, though, if, if she was trying to cheat him, and maybe she was, then why would she not have just taken the key, gone to the bureau, got point. the insurance policy out herself before the executor got there? I mean, she could have, she... for that matter, taken the keys off the dresser instead of him giving them to her. Yeah, Lacey... Did she know the life insurance policy was in the drawer? Maybe not. I don't think she I knew, mean, which is why I don't think she was trying to cheat him. I think she had, I think she had no idea the thing was in there. 
She because if she did, she probably would have done what, done what you said and taken it out because she had the keys, right? She had no idea. That um, and she only found out about it probably later. It's like, oh crap, the policy was in the drawer. I had the key to the drawer, therefore I have the policy. I mean, you can imagine the sort of revelation she had, and then they're like, no. So I mean, the fact that Mr. Van Pelt didn't even tell her the policy was in there again suggests that he really didn't intend to give it to her. Right? Because if, if that was his intent, he could have said, Hey, go open it up, give it to me. That was taking what, a minute? You know, on his dying death. But that that that's my read. I you know I think I think your 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 speculations is fair. Okay. Is that Javon? Are you in the classroom today or are you are you home? No, I'm at home today. Okay, good. I had a so I was wondering, you know how it's like in a contract, um, they say that like when you're like um, on your deathbed and you can't, they're not able to, uh, they're not capable of making intent, you know, to like form a contract and stuff. Is that is that similar? Like, how was that when it comes to? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the idea of the holographic will I mentioned a few minutes ago. When you're about to die, the courts are very permissive that you get your intent out there, right? They, they don't want to happen where you're dead and then the courts have to decide where your property goes. So if you're in your deathbed, it's kind of like contracts. You can make uh, this holographic will where you just, again, take a pencil on a cocktail napkin. That's enough. That's enough for a valid will. Uh, but if you're doing it in advance, you need, you need lawyer, you know, you don't need a lawyer, but you need witnesses to, to sign off on it. Make sense? Yeah. I mean, but it kind of it kind of didn't answer the question. Like, <laughs> like, what if someone they deem like the person incapable, uh, like mentally incapable? Of, right. With, with with you're talking about like a holographic deathbed will. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you know, like yeah, in, like in con capacity, uh, right? Yeah. So look, the the short answer is. Even if you're on your deathbed and you're sort of you're, you're losing you're losing lucidity, right? You're not clear-minded. The courts are going to try to enforce the document unless there's really good evidence that you're not. The reason why you have witnesses for a real will is they can attest he was in a sound state of mind when it was signed. But on a deathbed, the courts are going to try and do their best to interpret whatever you wrote down. Yeah, no, that makes all right. That makes sense. Yeah, Grayson, go ahead. What about a witness to the, if there was a witness to the oral gift, like if there was someone that was there that could say this is what actually happened? Well, this here, Miss Houston, right? The other, the nurse, she was there. So the, you did have a witness. That's generally not going to be enough because the interest, the witness is, is part of the family. She might be, you know, she might have, maybe she, maybe she's going to cut the life insurance policy for all we know. So it's not always the most objective witness. The, the witness is really to be someone who don't stand to benefit. Uh, Michael, go ahead. Uh, this may be too off subject, but um, curious if she would have tried to make a claim for common law marriage after this. You know, I don't know if North Carolina has common law marriage. I have no idea. They just abolished it not too long. Ago. Did they? I didn't know that. Um, I suppose she could have claimed it. Um, although maybe the fact they never actually held her out as wife would would, would defeat it because said, "I'm going to marry you. I'm going to marry you." Not married yet. So I think. The fact that you say you're going to marry someone refutes the idea that you're currently holding yourself out as married. Yeah. Uh, we'll do common law marriage a little bit later this semester. It's a, it's a good thought. Yes, Sandra, go ahead. Yeah, so would the court consider, like, if the guy was too sick to get the, um, like, the thing out the drawer, like, maybe he was, because it said his voice was, like, giving yeah. out, so. Yeah, I mean, who knows what he even said? Maybe he was mumbling, and they heard, I'm giving you everything, and he actually said, I'm giving you nothing, right? You know, it, there was no recording. There's no there's no video, so you, you don't know for sure, which is why the courts are so skeptical of these sort of constructive delivery with these um, gifts ca cause of mortis, right, right before he died. They, they don't like enforcing them. Okay. But they presume that the person who's, who's here to talk about it, what's, what's that phrase, dead men tell no tales from the parts of the Caribbean? Right when you're dead, you can't you can't say what your intent was. Yeah. Okay. Dead men tell no tales. It's from the actual ride. If you ever if you ever like to go to Disney World again, that that's what you'll hear. Okay. Is that Quinny with a hand up? 
Oh, yeah, I actually saw you. Okay, I'm sorry if you're waiting for so long. I apologize. I'm going to mute you. I can only see, like, two of you on the screen because of where the camera is. Uh, so go ahead. Um, I just have a question. So in terms of, like, constructive delivery and symbolic delivery, um, you, have to, you have to, like, make it known, like, the actual object that you're intending to do it, or if it's just, like, your keys. Well, that that's that's also the problem here. If he said these keys open up the dresser and you get whatever's in the dresser, that would have been evidence of an intent. But he said, "Here are keys." He points to the furniture, which suggests he wants to give her the furniture. Okay, but just like in general, like if you're the more you say, the better, right? If you say these are keys for a lockbox, go to the bank, go to the Bank of America on Westheimer Road, box number fifteen twenty two. Here's the key. Okay, that's pretty good evidence, right? Versus here's a key. I have all these keys in my house. I don't even know what they open anymore, right? You, know, they, you, you, have, you have those drawers, these random keys. Who, who the hell knows even opens? If you go, you know, you're trying to open every every uh, every door. Thanks, Quinny. And if you're in the classroom, just raise your your Zoom hand because I, I don't always see the um, the people actually raising their physical hands. Uh, Luis, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. This is what Quinny just said, but I just kind of want to make it more, a little more clear. So if I say symbolic delivery, it's basically assigning any object. To represent the object you're intending to get, so I can say um, this chapstick is symbolic of me giving you the car. Yeah, I mean, courts can be skeptical about that. That's just chapstick, bro. Right? Sorry. Okay, uh, so it has uh, to be like kind of <laughs> like similar value in a way. Yeah, it, it, it okay. had. I think there has to be because again, if, if you're dead, it's a different story. If you're alive, you can come back and say, "No, I didn't even chapstick as a car. That's ridiculous. Why would I say a, a stick of chapstick is for a car? Right? Maybe the keys easy. to the car." You have some of the okay. keys to the car. That's good. At that, that's a, that, that's better than chapstick. Okay, so the symbolic object has to be somewhat relevant to what you're intending to get. I mean, look, if it's challenge, you, I would want more than a stick of chapstick, my friend. Gotcha. All right, cool. All right, very good questions, Lacey. Go ahead. Sorry, I have one more. I know we need to go move on, but in the very last sentence of this case, he says, "There's no such thing in this state as symbolic delivery in gifts, either inter vivos or causes mortis." Is that still the case, or no? Did he just throw that I, I, I the reason why I don't like that sentence is he kind of ignores it and he permits constructive delivery in other contexts. He kind of okay. says that and then doesn't do it because he he okay. suggests that you could have constructive delivery of a piano, but they just didn't have it here. So I would ignore that sentence. I read it. I'm like, oh, why did he say that again? It's a crappy opinion, but, but okay. it's, it's been I the book like forever. It circled it and rule next to it. Yeah, no, I I. Uh, in the case summary, I don't include that sentence. I think it's probably wrong. Okay. okay. All right. I want to move on, and we are, oh, God, so short on time. I'm going to need to lecture, but I apologize. Uh, unfortunately, when the review takes longer than I you know, prefer, then I have to sort of move quickly at the end, but I'll get it done. Um, the next case is very hard. It's about a painting hanging on a wall, right? <laughs> A painting can only be in one place at a time, right? You can't chop the painting in half. You can't clone it, right? The painting exists in one place. All right. The father here tried to be a little bit cute. He wrote a letter to his son and he said, son, when I die, you get this painting. So I was like, all right, cool, whatever. Um, but then father talked to his lawyer and he realized wait a minute there gonna be some tax because the tax consequences that this is a testamentary gift right you need to create a will have witnesses and there's a huge problem so he tells his son son rip up that second letter um, at that point there was no valid gift why because there was no present intent the intent was to give it in the future after he dies. And you can rip up a testamentary gift at any time. You can rip it up. There's no gift. There's no need to revoke it because you didn't have any present intent. There was no intent. There's no delivery. All right. But then we get to the second letter. And the second letter was complicated. He says, well, it's wrong that I'm going to – what I wrote before was wrong, Right. I still you want I still want you to have it after I die, but I didn't do it the right way. So I'm gonna do something different. 
here's another letter which says, I am giving you as a present this painting, but it's going to stay in my living room. When I die, you can take it, but for now it stays in my living room. What's going on here? So here, my friends, we need to think of the bundle of sticks, right? The bundle of sticks. We described the bundle of sticks before to separate between present, I'm sorry, to distinguish between the right to exclude, the right to sell, the right to convey, right? There are different sticks in this bundle. I want you to think of the bundle of sticks a little bit differently. Instead of thinking about just the right to exclude, the right to sell, the right to possess, the right to use, think of present versus future interests, right? You know, for example, I own this house today, and in the future, if I die, my kids get it, right? I have a present interest, and my kids have a future interest, right? The same piece of land, the same bundle has different sticks. You have a present stick and a future stick. All right, with me. If I tell you, I will give you something after I die. That's a testamentary gift. I can rip it up at any time because there's nothing conveyed in the present. What if I tell you today, February 10th of 21, I am giving you a future interest in a painting. What? Today in the present, I am giving you a future interest in the painting. And that future interest kicks in after I die. Again, is there a present intent? Yes. Is there a delivery? Yes. I am giving you today a future interest. I just blew your mind, so no, I did. I'm sorry. I am giving you today a future interest. Josh, how the hell does that work? Property is not fixed in time. At any period, a piece of property can have both a present owner and a future owner. Right. Let's say I give you a lease and I say on January 1st, 2021, I'm sorry, January 1st, 2022, I am moving into this apartment. I have it in writing. It's my lease. I can't live there yet, but it's a future interest. Right. I know on January 1st of 2022, I am moving in. No matter what happens, I'm moving in. I am giving you that lease today. I'm conveying that interest today, but for the future. So what the father did here was similar to the lease. He said, I'm giving you today a future interest, but I'm going to hold on to it for now. Think of it like a lease that lasts forever long the father's alive, right? The father holds on to it, and when the father dies, it goes to the son. We call this interest a life estate. Someone mentioned it earlier. I was very happy to hear that. I can't remember who it was, but that was a good answer, whoever it was. Someone called it a life estate. What that means is the father's keeping it for his life, and upon the father's death, it goes to the son. But the key point is the future interest that the son has. The future interest that the son has was given as a present interest. I know you hate it. In the present, you give a future interest. I am today giving you a future interest, and that is an inter vivos gift. It is not a testamentary gift. Why does that matter? Because you do not need witnesses for an inter vivos gift. You see, what happened in this case is the mother claimed that this was a testamentary gift. Therefore, there are no witnesses. Therefore, the gift is void. And the son doesn't get the painting, which was worth millions. In contrast, the son says this was not... A testamentary gift. This was not a testamentary gift. It was inter vivos gift. He simply gave me a future interest in the painting. And that was a future interest given in the present. And it was delivered. And it was accepted. All three are satisfied. It was a valid inter vivos gift. Therefore, the painting... I'm sorry. Therefore, the interest belonged to the son. Ah. <sighs> 
if this doesn't make sense, um, I understand it's not an easy concept. Um, unfortunately for you all, this is the next month of our semester. Um, the bulk of the rest of this class is distinguishing present and future interests. So I love this case and I hate this case. This case will make a lot more sense in a few weeks, but you have to have it now in the gift topic, which sucks. But always think of property in terms of both what's the present interest and the future interest. And you can convey a future interest today that kicks in later. And that's not testamentary. Just think of it as like a, a leasehold uh, where the father keeps it for his life. And then when that time expires, whenever that is, we don't know, it goes to the son. Lance. Um, oh, oh, no, you're in the classroom. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Lance. Uh, so we uh, did it again. So you got you to gotta mute your computer. You, if you're in the classroom, you have to keep your computer on mute. Go ahead, Lance. Try one more time. Professor, I think you have the classroom muted right now. No, the classroom is not on mute. Um, uh, I'm sorry, unmute. Okay, go ahead, Lance. Uh, so and when I ordered the repass, we just heard about uh, wills. And there's one for a verbal will. It sounds like the exact same thing as a future interest. No, it's not. Don't 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 say it's the same thing. They're absolutely different. A will is only giving the interest after you die. When you have a future interest, it's given in the present. You cannot revoke it. A will can always be ripped up, but if you give someone a future interest, that cannot be revoked. It's a inter vivos present gift for the future. So all you have to say is. I'm getting into you at this moment on my death. Yes. Uh, yes, that's a present interest. Exactly. Lance, uh, sorry, uh, Grayson, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of see how the difference between giving a will versus giving the present gift. Like, how do you make sure that you're giving the present gift versus You will? say, I intend to give you at present an interest in whatever. You may say it very clearly, right? A will uses very specific language. Upon my death, you will receive versus I'm giving you today of sound mind, this future interest in the painting. I mean, the father's letter didn't do this exactly, but it, it was basically hinting at, I'm giving you this interest now, but it's going to stay in my apartment, on my wall. Right? He's trying, he's trying to be a little cute about it, but, but that's saying, I'm keeping an interest, I'm keeping life to save for myself, and you get it later. And that's why the court ruled for the son and not for the mom. All right, let me wrap up a bit, and I'll let you guys out of here. Uh, shortly, we're about a minute left. I'll start the minute poll as well. Um, when you have a gift question, always refer back to the elements. You have a present intent and delivery. Um, the first case, the Newman case, focused on delivery. Was there, in fact, a valid delivery? You can have actual delivery. You can have constructive delivery. You can have a symbolic delivery. But there has to be some delivery for it to work. The second case wasn't about delivery, right? It was about intent. And the father intended to give the son a future interest at present. How is it delivered? By the letter. You do not need to send the painting itself. Indeed, you can't send the painting itself. The painting itself is not the relevant item. The way you convey a future interest is through writing. And by saying the letter, there was a present intent to convey a future interest. And there was delivery. And the son accepted that delivery. Therefore, there was a valid interviewer's gift of the Klimt painting. Questions? Hey, Luis, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so that was basically a form of symbolic delivery? No, actual. 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 Okay, actual. Because think about it. When you talk about a bundle of sticks, right, there's no actual stick. This is no real bundle. To give the interest, you have to put in writing. So I guess you can call it symbolic, but really the letter is the actual delivery of the future interest. Okay. Right? Usually you would say, I'm giving you the piano. And I'm going to write about it in a letter because you can't hand the piano, right? But the only way to give a future interest is in writing. that can't be conveyed orally. All right? Thanks, Luis. Uh, uh, Garrett, go ahead. I think you're in the classroom as well. Uh, today, will that still work to dodge taxes? I'll talk that like a painting. Really? Yeah. Um, well, don't say dodge. That's a very negative word. Um, Tax evasion is illegal. Tax avoidance is legal, right? So 
you can avoid taxes, you can evade taxes. I want you to be very, Professor Yamamoto will beat me up if I say the wrong thing. Um, but you can evade taxes. And so you can't, you can avoid taxes, you can't evade taxes. But it's very often the case if you give something to someone inter vivos, you avoid all the testamentary issues. You avoid the will, you avoid probate. There's nothing wrong with giving someone an interest during life to avoid that process that's completely legal. It's not, it's not, it's not unethical or anything. But yeah, you will take an entire class on wills and trusts. You'll take a class on tax, which is basically designed to keeping your money away from the government. I mean, that's that's, that's what people try to do, right? Try to give as much to their uh, their, their family as little to the uh, the feds as they can, unless you want to write a check to the feds. All right, the minute poll is running. Any other questions? I see none. Uh, I'll be in office hours around two forty-five today. Otherwise, I'll see you on Monday. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.